سبحان الله عما يشركون We know him as Imam al-Nawawi but his full name is Abu Zakariya Yahya ibn Sharaf al-Hizami al-Nawawi He was born in 631 Hijri 631 that's roughly 800 years ago now in uh, the small town of Nawa from which he gets his uh, eponym which is in in Syria in a short space of time he's born in 3 in 631 passes away into the eternal rahmah of Allah azza wa jal in 676 45 years and in 45 years he's left behind a legacy that's made his name uh, a worldwide phenomenon and he's shafi'i in his fiqh but the hanafis and the malikis and the hanbalis acknowledge his scholarship and refer to him he is ash'ari in aqidah and yet the atharis as well as the maturidis also uh, celebrate his works the 7th century hijri was was a very turbulent time in muslim history on one hand from one end you had the crusaders that were waging uh, conflicts on the muslim lands that jerusalem was conquered for a large portion of imam an-nawawi's uh, time and in fact they reconquered jerusalem in uh, 1245 so very you know he was a young boy when it was reconquered and on the other hand in the year 1258 this is a watershed moment in muslim history when you have the mongols coming from the east and in, and invading and sacking baghdad and, and as we remember or we should remember that baghdad was the center of learning in in the entire world at that time and as much as the conditions for the muslims now are terrible and we certainly pray for afia and comfort for muslims all across the world if you read the history and the accounts of what happened in baghdad it pales in comparison to anything that we see today right because they say that the tigris and the euphrates that one of the rivers was running red with the blood of people that were killed and the other river was black with the ink of all the books that were tossed in the river right that this was a, a turbulent time this was a very difficult time and and at the, at the same time and two years later the year 1260 is the famous battle of ain jalut when the mongols are defeated for the first time right so at the same time the muslims uh, establish rule in mali and they establish a a a kingdom or a a state in indonesia so why is this all of this important is that we see that in the heartland of the muslim empire there's conflict and turmoil right but on the border on the hinterlands right to the south and to the east there's expansion and there's spreading of islam and it's a very ironic and a very fitting mirror of what's happening today in the muslim world right we see that the 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 muslim lands and the in the, the the traditionally muslim lands that they're under attack both internally and externally and we find that islam is on the on the hinterlands out in the west and out in the east that it's spreading and it's expanding and people are coming to islam like like never before so what should be appreciated is that despite this turmoil despite all of this th these conflicts that were going on that scholarship within the muslim lands not only thrived and not only uh, not only persisted but it thrived and flourished despite all that was going on now imam an-nawawi rahimahullah uh, he was born in the village of nawa which is which is in syria near damascus and this his town was not a very scholarly city it was it was not known for having huge madrasas or uh, all these famous scholars that lived there Uh, but even from a very young age Imam An-Nawawi was very attached to learning and it's related about him that he was remarkable even as a child as somebody who had a great great degree of seriousness to him his personality so you'll notice the average 3 4 5 year old they love running around they love playing with toys Imam An-Nawawi rahimahullah was not like that at all In fact from as a young child he was known to be as a child that would often contemplate and just think. 
So while the other boys are running around and playing, Imam al nawi rahimahullah would just be sitting there and watching and observing. And there's a very interesting incident that al marakashi one of the historians from Nawa, narrates about Imam al nawi He says it was this at this incident where Imam al nawi rahimahullah was at the age of eight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed a special love for him in my heart. What was this incident? That the other boys in the town, they were just running around and playing. And others, the other children were playing and they were chasing him and, and teasing him or taunting him as children will do, uh, to try to get him to join in their games. And he was sitting aside and running away from them and then sitting aside and crying and weeping. And so this person asked, why don't you play with the children? And he said, Mali hadha khuliqna. But it wasn't for this that we were created. And you see from a very young age that subhanAllah, Imam al nawi rahimahullah had a completely different outlook on life than the other children that were around him. From this event, al marakish actually went to speak to Imam al nawis Quran teacher, who went in turn, went to speak to Imam al nawis father and told him, look, your son has, you know, this special gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure he's given that nurturing, you know, that he deserves. So Imam al nawi rahimahullah, he finished his hifth of the Quran while he was in Nawa. So as a young boy before the age of puberty, he finishes his Quran hif. There's a story that's mentioned at the age of seven, that one night in Ramadan, on the 27th night, that the family was sleeping and, and, and they had a very small house. And Imam Anawi woke up and he, uh, and he told the rest of the family to wake up, wake up, wake up. And, and it was pitch black dark in the house. And he said, the father said to the son, he said, what is it? And he said, don't you see the entire house is illuminated? And the father said that I knew that he had seen the light of Laylatul Qadr on that night. Right? And this is at the age of, of seven. And at the age of 10 or 12, uh, you know, the scholars of the time, when they saw him through their firasa, right? firasa is a lost science. It's a, where, where people can just look at someone's face and know everything there is to know about that person. Right? So they saw, th uh, Imam al nawawi and they knew that he would grow up to be a, a great person so they, they counseled his father to support him and to, to encourage him to continue on this path. So eventually he finds his way to Damascus which where many of the great uh, madrasas of his day were and he begins to, uh, after he had basically exhausted all of the potential knowledge that he could gain from Noah, he's now in Damascus and this is when his life of scholarship really takes off. And you see that in these 45 years, he's written so many books. One of the books he wrote, Al Majmu', he actually died before he finished it. And this book within of itself is thousands of pages long. Now the scholars, you know, they took an approximation that if Imam al nawi rahimahullah started writing at the age of 18, till the day that he died, on average, how many pages did he write? He wrote an average of over 40 pages per day. In order for him to have achieved everything that he wrote, it would have been 40 pages a day from the age of 18 till the age that he died. That is how much he would have written per each day. So it shows you his great level of scholarship. What made him so unique, this is to say a little bit about his qualities, that he had immense and tremendous piety. They say that he would fast every single day. Uh, they say, for example, that uh, uh, his wara'a, his scrupulousness, which he, one could say that he inherited from his father, was also in him. So he would never eat from any of the public gardens because he didn't know if there was, somehow there were some rights that were transgressed in the accumulation or in the acquiring of that food. So his father would have to send food from his village and that would be the only food that Imam al nawawi rahimahullah would eat. Uh, he was, a, he was a tremendously uh, studious. They, he would go to 12 classes a day, which were an hour each, and he would review the notes from those classes from, the, from his shayukh that he had studied for another hour. Right? So 12 hours of study plus 12 hours of review is 24 hours. Now, he was engaging in tremendous amounts of nawafil and tahajjud and all of the other things. And so one asks like, how exactly was he able to do this? And the only answer we have is that you can't reproduce this in a laboratory. This isn't some scientific fact, but rather that he had tremendous 
barakah, tremendous uh, blessing uh, in his time. This is so amazing that I want you to think about, you know, how you treat guests when you come over to, their, to, the, to your house. You know, you'll bring, they'll come over to your house, you'll converse with them, you'll present them something to eat, and you know, just show them a good time to entertain them. Imam Anawi rahimahullah, the way he would treat his guests, he would have a sahan, he would have a plate ready in the middle of his house. Then any time someone wanted to come, they were more than welcome. However, they would go through two things. Number one, Imam Anawi rahimahullah had so many books that there was no place to sit except for Imam Anawi rahimahullah himself. So if you wanted to sit down, you would have to lift some books and you know, place them somewhere else. They didn't have bookshelves like we have today. So everything was just lying around on the floor. So that was the first difficulty. So you can imagine someone comes over to your house as I'm coming to visit, you know, they get the clear message that you don't want them there when there's no place to sit. So they'll say what is important and then they'll leave. And that is it. Imam Anawi rahimahullah, his students mentioned that it was when the guests would come that Imam Anawi rahimahullah would then take the time to sharpen his pencils. That that is the way he would keep himself busy. He didn't want anything to distract him from seeking knowledge. So when the guests would come, he would be speaking to them at the same time and at the same time sharpening his pencils so that no time would be wasted whatsoever. No time would be wasted whatsoever. And he himself said that, that he didn't sleep for two years lying down that he would just be sitting and reading and he'd fall asleep on his books and then he'd wake up a few minutes or 30 minutes later or whatever it was and he would just continue to do what he was uh, doing. Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, he didn't get married. And he comments on this himself. He said, I fear that if I was to get married, I would fall into something haram. Meaning that I wouldn't be able to fulfill the rights of my wife. And the rights of the wife are great in Islam. You know, they're very, very huge that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he emphasizes, you know, very heavily that the best of you are those that are best to your women folk, meaning the best to your wives. So he said he feared that he would fall into haram by not giving her her due rights because he loved knowledge so much. He loved teaching so much. And this is why that Imam An-Nawi, rahimahullah, he didn't get married. So I want you to understand the political context of where Imam An-Nawi, rahimahullah, lived. That Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, he lived at a time where a transition is taking place from the Ayyubid dynasty to the Mamluk dynasty. This has been the greatest fitna that struck the Muslim Ummah, the attack of the Mongols. That if you look at what they did with Baghdad subhanAllah, in that time, they said that they killed over 500,000 of the Muslims. And they would just take their heads and they would just pile them up in the city that you would see blood flowing in the streets of Baghdad, flowing into the rivers. And then who does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose to stand up and defend the Muslim you know, civilization? It is a group of slaves. And that is where the title of Mamluks came from, that they were possessed. And the head of the Mamluks at that time who stood up was this individual by the name of Zahir al baybaris So the ruler at that time, and he ends up becoming Khalifa, is the Zahir al baybaris Now, unfortunately, subhanAllah, you would think that an individual that comes from a very humble beginning, not having any wealth, any property, you know, he would appreciate wealth and you know, be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet unfortunately, the, this Muslim ummah has been plagued with, you know, rulers and leaders that overindulge in this dunya subhanAllah. So Zahir al baybaris he defeats the, the Mongols and this new Mamluk dynasty starts up. And then again, it becomes very oppressive, very, very oppressive. So now when this starts to happen, who is at the forefront of the opposition? It is Imam an nawi And Imam an nawi rahimahullah, this is a, a letter that is documented in, in history. He writes a letter to al Zahir al baybaris And he mentions that, you know, oh Zahir al baybaris you started as an individual that had nothing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now made you the leader of the Muslim empire. Do not abuse your rights over the people. This awqaf, it doesn't belong to the ruler, but it belongs to the Muslim state. And that is the way it should remain. And then you see that Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, he gets on to the forefront. And there's one other particular incident that you see from enjoining good and forbidding the evil, where Al-Zahir al baybaris again, you see his greed for wealth, that this is one of the first times that a tax is levied upon the people without reason. So in Islamic history, the general concept of tax is that the Muslim ruler is not allowed to tax the civilians. You're not allowed to tax the civilians up and until there's a need for it. 
So for example, the Muslims are going to war and they need that wealth, then they can be taxed. Or there's a need of the community, then they can be taxed. But the general case scenario is that they are not to be taxed. So now when the war is completely over, everything is finished, their need for the money was finished. So Zahir al bayburis instead of decreasing the tax on the people, he actually increases it on the people. And again, what does Imam al nawi rahimahullah do? Writes a very, very powerful letter that fear the day where you will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where in this dunya you are taxing the people and in the akhirah, it is your deeds that will be taxed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another very powerful, staunch and hard letter that he wrote to Zahir al bayburis Now when this letter was written, he asked, you know, who wrote this letter? And it was told to him that Imam al nawi rahimahullah wrote this letter. And then he became afraid, he didn't do anything. And you'll notice that even though Imam al nawi rahimahullah, he opposed Al-Zahir al bayburis to such an extent that always, you know, opposing him, Al-Zahir al bayburis never actually physically did anything to him. And it is said in the books of history that Al-Zahir al bayburis was asked, you know, why is it that you never imprisoned Imam al nawi Why is it that, you know, you never had him exiled? You know, why didn't you do anything? And he mentions over here, that any time I would think of Imam al nawi I would find a fear inside of myself. A fear that I couldn't do anything to him. And the scholars commented that this is a sign of the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he said that whoever tries to harm one of my awliya, one of my close slaves, then I will wage war against this individual. And this is why Al-Zahir al bayburis never actually harmed Imam al nawi This is why Al-Zahir al bayburis never actually harmed Imam al nawi some of his famous works that bear mentioning is number one, he, had a very, he has a very famous commentary on Sahih Muslim, which they say uh, is second only to uh, Ibn Hajar al Qalani's rahimahullah's commentary on Sahih Bukhari. Uh, he wrote, uh, you know, the, the Bustan al Arifin is another famous text. And then, of course, one of the most well known texts, in addition to the Arba'in al Nabawi, is the, the famous text, uh, Riyadh al Salihin, the, the Gardens of the Righteous, which is another collection. Uh, of ha a hadith which primarily deal with you know targhib and tarheeb about encouraging and admonishing people towards doing righteous actions and staying away from harmful actions and of course the perhaps the most well known of all of his texts is the arba'in of an nawawi as i mentioned he he dies at a relatively young age he's only 45 years old when he passes away and yet the works he left behind are tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amounts of work that he left behind. They say that when he passed away that all he owned was a, a thobe, a staff, and a turban. Just these three items of clothing is all he had. And uh, uh, he didn't want to have any marker over his grave. He didn't want his grave to be celebrated. And yet this, uh, you know, what ended up happening is that a tree grew from his grave, right? That this is a sign that you know and, and the tree as we know is a, is a very powerful metaphor which we don't have time to elaborate on but it's a symbol of life that even after he passes away that's a tree which symbolizes life uh, grows from his grave nonetheless despite him not wanting to have a marker now Adhabi rahimahullah when he concludes the biography of imam al nawi he mentions three important points he says that imam al nawi rahimahullah had three characteristics that he was at the pinnacle of, that he excelled at. And if any scholar of Islam just had one of these characteristics, he would be considered a great Imam within his own right. But Imam al nawi rahimullah had become the pinnacle, had excelled at these three characteristics. Number one, his level of scholarship, that learning, reading, writing, and most importantly, disseminating. He was at the top of his game at that. Number two, his level of asceticism that his lack of love for this dunya was unparalleled. Someone constantly worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone taking advantage of his time, someone always doing some sort of dhikr. And then the third thing that he mentions is Imam al nawi rahimahullah enjoining good and forbidding evil. And subhanAllah, these are the characteristics that all the scholars are meant to have. You know, these are like fundamental elements. And then it was Imam al nawi rahimahullah that excelled at all three of them, was the pinnacle at all three of them that made him the great Imam that he was. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy upon him and forgives us for his shortcomings and raises us with him in Jannatul Firdaus. Ameen.
ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد ابدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الايمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القراني